This is lecture number 14 by Robert Benoit of Biblical Theological Seminary, lecture on the major prophets. We're continuing with the major prophet Isaiah, lecture number 14. See on your sheet, Isaiah chapter 40 is the overture. I had mentioned this before, basically bringing up McCray's suggestion that we can compare this material with a musical composition. Chapter 40 is a unit in its own right, somewhat distinct from what follows. And McCray has suggested that it compares to the overture of a musical composition in the sense that it touches on a number of themes that recur in subsequent chapters. It introduces these themes in chapter 40. Then in subsequent chapters, these themes are further developed. But in chapter 40, everything seems to be quite general. It's not nearly as explicit or specific as much of the material that follows in subsequent chapters. It's quite general, as I said, in chapter 40. God says he's going to deliver, but the chapter doesn't seem to have exclusive reference to one specific deliverance. It's more general. There are people who are suffering, people who are in misery, and the idea is that they will be delivered from their suffering. Now, that would apply to people in exile, but it could also apply to people who are suffering from the results of sin. God is going to deliver them, too. In other words, he will deal with the sin problem and provide a means of deliverance from it. Of course, ultimately, that comes through the coming of Jesus Christ. So there is a certain joy involved in the chapter, and that's joy over the coming of Christ, as well as joy concerning deliverance from the Babylonian exile. All of that seems to be in view in chapter 40. So it's not surprising that chapter 40 is one of the great chapters of the entire Bible. It certainly is a chapter that is often read by many people, particularly people who may be in misery or in suffering, people who are wondering what God is doing, and they can find great comfort in this chapter. Let's look at the first two verses. We read, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And that's quoted again from chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort is to come to Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been suffering, but now she is to be comforted. She is told her warfare is accomplished, that is, her hard service, her compulsory labor, her service of war have been accomplished. The last phrase is, she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That's usually understood as punishment. She has received double for all her sins. Well, look at your citations. McCray has an interesting suggestion there on page 29 of these citations. And this is taken from pages 40 to 43 of McCray's book, The Gospel of Isaiah, which I might mention is on this section of Isaiah and is an extremely useful little book. I'm quoting McCray. A rather unusual interpretation has been the assumption that double here means double blessing and that the phrase is a promise that Israel would receive double blessing in spite of all her sin. Such an interpretation lacks philological justification. There is no basis for introducing the idea of blessing into the word double. The solution of the difficulty lies in the recognition that the Hebrew word used here, one of several that are commonly translated double, can properly be considered as similar to the English word double, when used to represent a person who looks so much like another that it is difficult to distinguish between them. End quote. Saddam Hussein, who was the leader and dictator and tyrant of Iraq, is said to have had a number of doubles, I understand. People who look so much like him that you never know where he is because he has a double. Each of them is but a double of the other, but neither is to be considered is equal or twice the other. It might be clear to render the Hebrew term here as equivalent or counterpart or substitute rather than double. The phrase looks forward to the time when God will declare that the equivalent for the sin of all believers has been paid. 
No man could pay this penalty. Only the divine servant of the Lord could do so. So you see, McCray understands the statement there, quote, she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins, end quote, the idea that she has received from the Lord's hand an equivalent, a counterpart, a substitute for all her sins, and pointing forward to Christ. But in any case, God says his people are to be comforted. That may be viewed as having some connection with deliverance from exile, from Babylon, but I think more basically, and importantly, it has reference to deliverance from sin through Christ. Notice, I think McCray's suggestion is certainly worthy of consideration, particularly because of that phrase in the middle of the verse, which says, Her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for. Her iniquity is pardoned. Well, equivalent or substitute, a person equivalent to Israel has been substituted for her and atoned for her sin, is the idea that is suggested here. In other words, if you simply limit this to return from exile, it hardly means that her iniquity is pardoned. There seems to be more involved here. Verses 3 to 5. The idea of deliverance is further stressed. Quote, A voice of one calling, In the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. End quote. Again, the idea of deliverance. God's deliverance is at hand. A way is to be made straight. That could apply to the exile. In other words, the people in Babylon see the hills and valleys and difficulties of all sorts that separate them from their homeland being removed, and this enabling them to go back. But the interesting thing is, in all four of the Gospels, this section is taken as a reference to John the Baptist, not to the exile. A voice of him who cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That phrase, if you look at Luke 3, chapter 3, verses 4 to 6, it says the following, as is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. In the context in Luke, that is speaking to the ministry of John the Baptist. Verse 3 says, he went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, etc. That is in Luke. Matthew gives the same results. Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. We read the following. Well, starting with verse 1. In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. End quote. That was from Matthew. Let's look at Mark, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. We read, A voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. End quote. John did baptize in the wilderness, and he did preach the baptism of repentance. And we find this also in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, verses 19 to 23. This is the witness of John. And then we go down to verse 23. He says, I am not whom you think I am. They say, Are you the prophet? He answers, No. Finally, they said, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And then John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. So you see, when you get to verse 5, it says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That's certainly the climax of what you think about the Incarnation. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, it says in John chapter 1, verse 14, and continues, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so you see, John announced the way of the coming of Christ by using this passage from Isaiah. Now, when you get to Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8, there is a complete change in idea. We read, A voice says, Cry out! And I said, What shall I cry? Here's the answer. All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. End quote. The basic idea here is the failure of every human being and earthly institution to endure. In contrast to that, God's word stands forever. Now, that's very general. It can be applied to many situations, perhaps to the people in exile. You could be thinking of the greatness of the Babylonian power. What Isaiah is saying is human power really is transient. It's illusory. All flesh is grass, it withers and fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Verse 9 reverts to the idea of comfort to Jerusalem, because God will bring deliverance. I think, without getting into details of this, I think the New International Version is a better translation here. Notice the King James says the following, O Zion, that brings good tidings, get thee up into a high mountain. Whereas, if you look at the NIV, verse 9 says, You who bring good tidings to Zion, go on up on a mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Well, comfort Jerusalem because God is bringing deliverance. That's the message here. Then verses 10 and 11 is the greatness of God's deliverance. We read, See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. End quote. The Lord is strong. He will accomplish what he desires. The King James says, quote, The Lord will come with a strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. End quote. So he is strong. He is able to accomplish what he sets out to do. But towards his own people, he is like a shepherd who gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them in his bosom. He gently leads those that are with young. So this speaks of the gentleness of the Lord's deliverance. Then with verse 12, you again get a short transition. I want to give you a handout here to put an overhead up for the rest of the chapter. Verse 12 says, quote, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains and the scales and the hills in a balance? End quote. You get a sharp transition of thought between verses 11 and 12. 11 talks about the shepherd carrying the lambs in his arms and gently leading those with young. Here you come in with a completely different idea. The gentleness of the Lord is stressed in verse 11, but that's not a sign of weakness. Verse 12 and following compare the Lord with the gods of the heathen and point out how great his power is, particularly his creative power. Certainly, that idea of the omnipotent power of God is one particularly important to people who are suffering. It would be important to people in exile. It would be important to people in Isaiah's own day, in the time of Manasseh. It's important to people in any time of difficulty and suffering. There is a tendency, when you're in that kind of situation, to think God doesn't exist or that he is powerless to do anything. There are a number of passages in the material that follows chapter 40 that stresses the greatness and the power of God. Now, if you look closely at the structure of verses 12 through 31, I think you can see that the chapter is very carefully constructed. Even though that structure may be obscured by shifting from one idea to another idea to another idea and back to the first idea, there's a lot of movement like that, the chapter is not haphazard. 
It requires a fair amount of study and work to discover the structure and the relationship of the parts to one another. But remember the analogy with the musical composition. You can listen to music and be moved by the course of the music without really understanding anything about how carefully the composer structured things in order to give that force, to give that impression. So that without consciously realizing how carefully all this has been constructed, you can read through it and be impacted by it. But when you sit down and analyze it, you find that there is very careful structure behind it after all. Now, if you look at that handout, you notice that in verse 12, you have the question, who created the universe? And there are five aspects to the question, and all have the answer, God. C. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Who with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? So you see, you have five phrases here. Who has done all these things? Who created the universe? And the answer to all of the questions is God. Now, that's the first strophe. The second one, both of which have to do with nature, and the second one is chapter 40, verses 13 to 14. There the question is, who was God's helper at creation? And again, you get five aspects to that question. See, there's a structure there, five and five. But here, all have the answer, no one. Who has understood the mind of the Lord, or instructed him in his counseling? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him, and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge, or showed him the path of understanding? And again, this breaks down into five phrases, all with the answer, no one. God did all this by himself. Then you move on to the third strophe, which is the first climax, and this is verses 15 to 17. And it reads, The nations are as nothing. See, you make a transition. The first two strophes deal with nature. Who created the universe? Who was God's helper at creation? The third strophe moves to history. So in verses 15 to 17 you read, and I'm quoting here, Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. End quote. So the nations are as nothing. Babylon may look powerful, particularly if you're in exile in Babylon, but before the power of God, nations are nothing, including Babylon. They are nothing. They are like a drop in the bucket. They are counted as small dust on the balance or the scales. See, those kinds of images point out the insignificance of the power of nations. If you go on to the fourth strophe, comprising verses 18 to 20, you have radical change of idea again. You move to this theme of idolatry and the futility of idolatry. Idols don't move. Chapter 40, verses 18 to 20, we read, To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that it will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. End quote. Notice that phrase is introduced by this question, to whom will you compare? To whom will you compare God? Or what likeness will you compare him to? Are you going to compare God to these pieces of wood created by man? So the thought of the first section is developed by comparison. God is the Lord of nature. He's the Lord of history. And you compare him with a stick of wood? To whom will you liken God? Answer, to no one. He is unique. When you get to the fifth trophy, verses 21 to 24, you have a second climax. God is the Lord of nature and of history. Nature and history are brought together. Chapter 40, verses 21 to 24 read, quote, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? 
Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He, meaning God, sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than he blows on them and they wither, and the whirlwind sleeps them away like a chaff. Now, in the second climax, you have it again introduced with the question here, have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? God is the Lord of nature and history, and in the literary construction, you have four have-nots. Verse 21, introduced with the Hebrew expression, halo, meaning have not. Here we read it. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you? Have you not understood? These are the four so-called have you nots, Hebrew expressed with halo. Then three participial double lines follow in verses 22 to 24. Three participial double lines are he who sits, verse 22, he who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. So he that sits, spreads, brings. You have these participles. Again, sits, spreads, and brings. Then you have three verbs introduced by scarcely or hardly. It's in the Hebrew word. Yea, the King James says, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. Three verbs introduced by scarcely or hardly in verse 24. Then the sharp, Hebrew, it is the gum, introduces the conclusion in verse 24, the second part. The King James says, and he shall also, but that is the Hebrew, the gum, and he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away like stubble. Now, that conclusion provides the second climax, which makes the first one more definite and more emphatic. The first one, nations are as nothing, but here he is going to blow on them. They are going to wither and be taken away like stubble. Notice the comparison or correspondence between the triad of verse 22 and 23, that's whose participial double lines referred to, with the first three strophes. Verse 22, God is creator. See, verse 22 speaks about the one who sits on the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spreads them out like a tent of dwelling. That God is creator, and that compares with the first trophy, who created the universe. Whereas verse 23 is God's work in history, which compares with the third trophy, the nations are as nothing. You see the participles, he who sits and he who spreads, the first two trophies. He who brings the princes to nothing, that's history, and that compares with God's work in history that you see in the third of those double participial lines. You get a repetition of structure moving from nature to history, each two of nature, one of history, in both places. Move on to the sixth trophy, chapter 40, verses 25 to 27. We read, To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal? says the Holy One. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? End quote. Well, verses 25 to 27, the Lord is incomparable. You have that same question, you see, introducing strophe 6 as you had strophe 4. When you read, To whom will you compare me? The Lord is incomparable. And you see the real focus of that section in verses 25 to 27 is in verse 27. Whom will you compare the Lord to? You now look at his creative power. How can you say in verse 27 that my way is hidden from the Lord? You might be in difficulty. You might be in misery. You might be in misery. 
You may not understand what's going on, but when you focus on who God is, on his rule over nature, his rule over history, how can you ever question that he doesn't know what's going on with you? History is the ultimate comfort for God's people in distress. Again, that's introduced by the question, have you not known, just like it was in the second climax. Have you not known, have you not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So you see, in verse 27, the preceding verse, how can one who is so powerful forget those whom he has set apart for his own purposes? Why do you say, my way is hid from the Lord? How can that be? Now, when you get to Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8, there is a complete change in idea. We read, A voice says, Cry out! And I said, What shall I cry? Here's the answer. All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. End quote. The basic idea here is the failure of every human being and earthly institution to endure. In contrast to that, God's word stands forever. Now, that's very general. It can be applied to many situations. Perhaps to the people in exile. You could be thinking of the greatness of the Babylonian power. What Isaiah is saying is human power really is transient. It's illusory. All flesh is grass. It withers and fades. But the word of the Lord stands forever. What I want to do from this point, as you notice on your outline, is move to the servant of the Lord theme. I gave you those five or six themes before. We are now left with the servant of the Lord theme. It would be nice if we could move through Isaiah 41 through 66 and trace the way all those themes are developed. It's unfortunate to have to leave one out because we just don't have time and we won't get their full impact for that reason. But they are closely related and these themes do work together. Perhaps sometime you'll be able to go through this on your own. But with time considerations, we just can't do it here. So what I want to do is take one theme, the theme of the servant of the Lord, and work through that theme. It certainly is one of the great, important ones, particularly from a messianic perspective. Now, let's see how that works out. A few comments in general are in order before we get into specific passages. Critical scholars have often attempted to isolate what they call the four servant psalms, which I mentioned before. We read there in Wybray the comment about the so-called Four Servant Psalms. That's at the top of page 29 of your citations. But the four that are normally isolated are chapter 42, 1 to 7. It's really not correct to limit the servant passages to those four passages, but those are certainly four major passages. But critical scholars often isolate those four and say they have their own separate origin and authorship. They are secondary to the original text and have been inserted into the original text. But as I mentioned, that theme is much more complex than being limited to just four passages that are mentioned by Wybray. It's found in numerous other places in Isaiah as well. What I want to do is trace through every reference to the servant in this section of Isaiah as we look at the servant theme. So let's begin that, and what we want to do is see how the servant theme relates to this larger problem of the exiles, what the connection is, and of course, how it relates to the coming of Jesus Christ. The first one is Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8 and following. You read there, and I'm quoting, But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. 
I took you from the ends of the earth, from the farthest corners I called you. I said, You are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. End quote. I'm not going to read further for the moment, but that's the first occurrence of the servant's name, you see, in verses 8 and 9 of the expression, the servant of the Lord. It says, you are my servant. The Lord is speaking. Now, elsewhere in the Old Testament, the term servant is used in a variety of ways, often simply of godly people, sometimes more, sophi- sometimes more specifically of prophets. It's used of Moses, it's used of Joshua, and it's used of Elijah. But as used in Isaiah, it takes on a particular significance. That becomes clear as we trace the theme. It begins here in chapter 41. It then grows in importance and reaches its climax in chapter 53. As we will see, at first it is not altogether clear exactly what is meant by the phrase servant. Even though this verse 8 seems quite explicit, it gets more complicated as we move on. It seems here in verse 8, where we read, Israel, you are my servant. Who is the servant? Well, clearly it seems that it's Israel. What we find in this passage is, the Lord gives the reason why he is going to protect Israel. He says, the Lord has chosen Israel as one to be his servant. You, Israel, are my servant. Then in verse 10 we read, Fear not, for I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. And then if you go down to verse 13, we read, For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear. I will help you. Do not be afraid. O Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. See, I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp, with many teeth. End quote. If you read through the passage, the servant is called by God and will not be cast off. The enemies of the servant will be confounded, but the strength of the servant is to be found in the Lord, not in himself. See, verse 14 says, quote, Do not be afraid, O worm Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. See, I will make you into a threshing sledge. End quote. And remember, threshing sledges had sharp edges that they used in order to thresh the grain. So it seems clear in chapter 41 that the servant is Israel. The extent of the passage is not altogether clear how far this theme goes, but probably it goes down to verse 19, but that's debated. But all is quite general there. Let's go to the second passage, and that's one of the major ones too, and that is Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 7. We read, Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out, or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law the islands will put their hope. This is what the God, the Lord says, who created the heavens. Here you get an interspersal of the verse with that creative power theme again. Who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it? Who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it? I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. So, in Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 7, again, you're talking about the servant. Quote, Behold my servant. End quote. A picture is presented of the work that the servant will do. The servant is to do a work in the world for God. Here it doesn't say who the servant is, as Isaiah chapter 41 verses 8 and 9 do, where it said, You Israel are my servant, 
Here it doesn't say who the servant is, but a picture is given of the work of the servant that he is to accomplish. It's interesting, if you turn to Matthew chapter 12, verses 18 to 21, this passage in Isaiah is applied to Jesus. Matthew chapter 12, verse 18 says, and I'm quoting here, Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. In his name the nations will put their hope. End quote. That's in the context applied clearly to Jesus. But here's what it says in verse 1 of chapter 42 of Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect. The servant is God's elect, in whose soul he delights, and the Spirit of God is on him, and he is going to bring justice to the nations, to the Gentiles. Continuing in chapter 42, verses 2 to 4, you have the dignity and gentleness of the conduct of the servant. He's not going to cry or lift up or cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break. He doesn't exert violent effort to accomplish his task, but his work is to be worldwide. Notice in chapter 42, verse 4, quote, He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has set justice in the earth and the coasts shall wait for his law. End quote. Now, the word coasts is a reference to distant lands. Verse 5 sort of interrupts this description of the work of the servant to answer the questions. Who can this be, and how is this possible? Well, it's possible because God says so, and God is the creator of the heavens. Thus says God the Lord, he who created the heavens and stretched them or spread them out. He's the one that is going to accomplish this through the servant. Now, questions begin to arise at this point. You see in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8 and 9, it says, Israel, you are my servant. But the question that arises is, how can Israel fulfill what's described here? How can a people in bondage, misery, in exile, do what is said here, the servant of the Lord will do? See, verse 6 and 7 says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. End quote. How can Israel do that when Israel herself is a prisoner? In a sense, she's in a dungeon in Babylon. That question is not just one that might come to your mind as you read it, or to the mind of the person who heard it. It's one that expressed later in the chapter as well. Let's go down to verse 19. We read, Who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one committed to me, blind like the servant of the Lord? You have seen many things, but have paid no attention. Your ears are open, but you hear nothing. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. But this is a people plundered and looted, all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prisons. They have become plunder with no one to rescue them. They have been made loot with no one to say, send them back. End quote. So in verse 19, that very question is expressed. How can Israel do all this as a servant when she herself is blind and deaf? But verse 21 says, the work of the servant will be done. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Then in verse 22 again, you have that difficulty. How can Israel fulfill the demands of the work of the servant when Israel is a people robbed and spoiled, snared in holes, hidden in prison houses? The problem seems insuperable and unanswerable. But here's an additional note in verse 24 that says, quote, Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord against whom we have sinned? End quote. Verse 24 points out why Israel is in the condition she is in. Why is Israel robbed and spoiled? Why is Israel in the prison house? Why is Israel blind? It's because they sinned. 
And because they sinned, God gave his people into exile and suffering. Which of you will listen to this or pay close attention in time to come? Is the question asked by Isaiah. Who handed Jacob over to become loot and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? For they would not follow his ways. They did not obey his law. So he poured out on them his burning anger, the violence of war. There's the answer. So you see, in chapter 42, you have the servant presented as one who is to bring light and deliverance to the ends of the earth, to the Gentiles, to the nations, to deliver from captivity, prison, and bondage. Isaiah 41 has said Israel is God's servant. But the question is, how can Israel do that when Israel herself is in bondage and in darkness because of her sin? So we have to trace this theme further. You see, up to this point, you have a lot of questions. Israel is the servant. Israel has a task to do, but it doesn't seem Israel is able to do the task because Israel herself is sinful and in bondage. You need some kind of resolution for that as we go further. Well, my time is over. We'll pick up that theme later on. This is the end of lecture number 14 on the Major Prophets by Robert Vinoy, Biblical Theological Seminary, continuing, in this case, with the prophet Isaiah. <laughs>